What's up, guys? This is Adi again, Gate 7 International, coming back to you. This is January 1st, the time recording. Happy New Year to all of you. Looking forward to everything that 2024 has to bring Libyakos. And certainly, it has already brought us a couple of deep dives. Before the New Year, we had the first one with Fran Navarro. And now we already have our second scouting report for our second early signing for the for the window of the winter that is gelson martins and we are very excited to talk about this winger 28 years old and astonishing astonishing figure that is playing for monaco uh, we're going to get into a lot more about him shortly before you guys if you haven't done so already don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel all of the engagements help us find more red and white fans and help us grow this community, which is just continuing to grow at a great and fast pace. You can also support us on Patreon. Patreon members are going to see this video before the player is announced. So before Gelson Martins is announced, uh, Patreon supporters get to see the video. We share data. You can join for just a dollar a month. Join our WhatsApp chat. You get to see everything that we are not allowed to share on social media. And you get to see early access to some of the data and some fun things we do. And I also make fun of a lot of people with AI. So you can get in on the mayhem and check us out on www.patreon.com slash gate seven international. Going back to the report on Gelson Martins, as I mentioned before, he's a winger, right footed, five foot seven, which means about 1.7 meters for the metric guys, the Europeans, I should say. 74 kilograms, 163 pounds. So not a huge guy, but he's got a solid build. Um, solid build at the time of the, the last check-in with White Scout, that is. So overall, pretty good build for a winger. Very quick. He was actually part of the same supporting squad that Podence was on. So the same sporting Lisbon team that we played almost six years ago at this point. He was a part of that team. Very interesting. Um, and he also left the team around the same time, Daniel Podens, when we got Daniel Podens from sporting. He went to Atletico Madrid following the fan invasion of training. So in the end, he played over 2,000 minutes with Daniel Podens. And as you guys know, even though everybody left for free at the time, everyone had to pay a fee. We paid a fee of about, I think it was 7 million euros to sporting for Daniel. And 22 million euros went to sporting from Atletico Madrid when he left. Now, following a disappointing season at Atletico, he went on loan to Monaco. And he did well enough to secure services, or for Monaco to secure his services at least, for 30 million euros. And now he's coming to us with Monaco. No fee reported, but they will retain a 10% sell-on for the player. Uh, contracted now until 2026. Nice to see that this is not just another loan signing. Uh, it's a player that we can build a core off of. Ideally, he's still 28, is a sellable asset in a way. And assuming things go well, it's not a problem or one less problem at least that we'll have to deal with over the summer. The player's profile is that of a very technical ball carrier, full of flair, step overs, turns, you name it. Not as low of a center of gravity if we're talking about dribbling like Daniel Podence, but he does have fast feet. Very agile, very fast, great acceleration, and just overall tricky. Quality first touch and control in almost any situation. Comfortable progressing the ball forward, not just into the final third, but in the penalty area as well. Has played in a 4-4-2 system, a 4-2-3-1, and he's also played in a system at Monaco where they would play here and there with a back three. Can play on both wings, but is usually on the right side of the field can play as attacking mid right behind the striker and has also played deeper as like an outside mid, right mid, and like a right center mid as well. I saw that in, in a couple of different scenarios. So versatile player, we'll say. Now with Ola Sobakin on the way out and Brinic about to leave on loan, he is going to be the reinforcements we have, or at least the very first reinforcements we're bringing in for the wing position. So before we start getting into some of the data, uh, regarding this player, I do have a small disclaimer for you guys. Um, the data that we are going to be using for the analysis is coming from the 2021-2022 season. And that's because it's the only relevant sample size that we have. He only played about 600 minutes this past season 
for Monaco. And this current season for Monaco, he has not played at all. His last official match for Monaco was in February of 2023, so almost a year ago. So because of that, we're pulling data from almost two seat. Well, it is two seasons ago at this point because this is the last good sample size of almost 3,000 minutes that we can compare from. And we will discuss the relevance of the data uh, you know, as we move forward. So getting us started, of course, here's the percentile chart. So this is mapping various aspects of play and what he has done, the specific data points attributed to him and how he compares to other wingers and attacking mids in Portugal on a per 90 minute basis. So we'll start with goal creation. And for those of you that maybe you're just tuning in for the first time, the goal creation stats are in that bottom third of the chart. You can see everything there from goal conversion to assist, goal creation, XG, XA, it's all there and how he, how he stacks up. And right away you can see he's not particularly amazing in anything, but he's about above average when it comes to his overall end product, whether it's key passes, opportunities, shots. Uh, well, shots is the one thing he's actually not above average in, but overall we see the end product here generally is above average in terms of volume and quality. Primary goal creation came in the form of balls being played to him from the wide areas while in stride, either on a counter or kind of a, a fast break. Generally, the ball was played either across the penalty area or to the top of the penalty area, and then he would follow with a very well-placed shot. Other types of shot creations involved cutting in from the wing and shooting um, after beating a defender 1-1-1. One, one, one. So very rarely did we see opportunities off of rebounds, but a number of shots from winning the ball off of pressuring a defender or helping to force a mistake in the press. There were quite a few opportunities like that. And looking at the data here, we see that he is underperforming his XG. So XG is sitting in that bottom left corner there. Uh, I just removed the label so you could see a little bit more clearly. You see his XG as well as expected goal contribution. And he, based on his XG, was underperforming relative to the opportunities that were being created. So there's still room for improvement and perhaps even higher production could be more sustainable. Assists came in similar fashion to the goals he was creating, but instead of taking a shot, he would play the ball to his to an open person. Assists were almost always on a break, whether a counter or a fast break from open spaces. He would sometimes even beat a defender after drawing uh, a and sorry, he would beat the defender and then draw the next defender to him, then lay the ball off. So uh, a lot of times, you know, whether it was laying the ball off in a ground pass or uh, across to the penalty area, these were situations that he would create those types of opportunities. In situations that were not from fast breaks, whether it was a counter or just a break in open play, the opportunities he created, the assists he created came following set pieces. He would interplay maybe with a teammate and then end up playing across inside the penalty area and there was the primary context for any goal creation that he had now looking at builds up in possession again if you're new to this and this is your first deep dive you're tuning into the build up metrics are at the very top it's that top third of the chart there where you can see things like 1v1 dribble success touches in the penalty area and and so on and so forth now in build up in possession Regarding his individual buildup, this player is going to be an asset carrying the ball forward into the final third, into the penalty area, or just progressing the ball forward. With his incredible dribbling ability and speed on runs inside, he will not only be great to spur a break for us, but he presents himself as a great outlet in transition. Where he seems to be the most dangerous in his buildup is when he's able to find himself in these lanes centrally, when he's making these runs in and behind the defenders, especially the central defenders. When he makes those moves centrally and gets the ball with space with just a defender to beat or even one just to get past space, we find him spur plays that result in the most dangerous goal-scoring opportunities. For example, Many times I would see him in transition running full speed towards the central defenders. And once he would draw one to him, he would lay the ball off either wide to a player or striker opposite of him and then move towards the back post of the goal to receive the ball again. That's when he would make the shot. 
He could also make great runs to the outside and create spaces for his striker. It was common to see two defenders get pulled towards him because of how dangerous he can be dribbling the ball. He works well in interplay and in getting into situations where he can play these one-two give-and-go situations. He's usually giving and then making the run to immediately receive, though, but not the other way around. Not that he can't do it, but this is just generally the volume that we saw. His agility, acceleration, and incredible speed make him an absolute headache in every facet of the game. He also has a penchant for threading a really nice through ball, too. So, something to add to the toolkit. And that is something we've kind of become accustomed to with Daniel Podenz, and it's no different with Gelson Martins. Especially when he's dribbling the ball and the defense is trying to contain him, he can thread lovely balls to his teammates, making runs behind the defensive lines. The way I'm discussing his buildup, I know some of you are probably wondering, well, what's the drawback then? All these all these great positives about the player, well, what's when's the shoe going to drop? And the drawback is, at least in most recent seasons of the film I watched, it's his selfishness. While there are plenty of matches where it looks like he can do no wrong, there's quite a few that I've seen where he can't do anything right either. And there were situations where like wide players, they're, they're running and he, they're in possession. He has the ball and he's drawn the defender towards him and his, 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 his colleague or, or his, his teammate is running wide open with an opportunity to score if he plays the ball and he just refuses to play the ball. Scoring opportunities also that he wastes because he just wants to make an extra dribble. Maybe this is a behavior as a result of his coach being clear in his intent not to use Gelson Martins regularly. And even at the beginning of the season, the coach of Monaco made it clear he wanted him gone, that he didn't even want to sign him because he didn't want the player and he had to trim the squad down. So maybe that has something to do with it. But either way, that's something that that is of concern to us. Uh, as fans, and it should be of concern to, to me if I were administration of Libyakos. Looking at his pass accuracy and with tighter focus maybe on his passing decisions, we see above average pass accuracy. And you can see that, again, uh, his, pass, his pass accuracy is like the third from the top up there. And he's, he's sitting above that 60th percentile. Um, he doesn't, he does take some risks downfield when he's trying to cross, obviously, or thread brawls through the defense. That's a lot of volume of his passing, which can have an impact on pass accuracy, obviously. So we're not super surprised by that, but otherwise any involvement in buildup is usually quick shovel passes to somebody in the defensive and middle thirds, especially so that he can make the runs and, and present himself for a ball that can really get him moving downfield with it. Cause that's where he wants to be. He wants to be in those situations where he is getting the ball in open space, running at the defenders um, towards the goal. And this behavior is very consistent while he's technically gifted and capable of interplay. He just wants to carry the ball forward as far as shape and positional awareness. I am forced to admit that, there's off field issues or maybe a mentality issue that's affecting his game because I've watched too many possessions to see him make perfect runs constantly and always be in the right area to, for me to believe that he doesn't know what he's doing. But then at the same time, I've witnessed enough plays of tactical failure that give me cause for concern. And normally this is something, Oh, if I see a lot of one, another, I'm thinking maybe he's just an inconsistent player and we're going to get somebody one day. He's good. One day he's bad but he's just too gifted and he is too smart. He so many, too many situations where he is doing the right thing very often, especially early on when he's at Monaco. But then in the last couple of years, it's like, who is this player? When, when did this happen? And again, I've read that this player can be a bit of a head case. And again, knowing how the Monaco coach made it very clear, maybe that impacted him and his ego. All players have egos it's reasonable to believe that this can affect his performances in this regard. But at the same time, for a player of this caliber, at one point I was reading old articles from before he was at Monaco that he was supposed to be the next big thing coming out. Coming out. And maybe this is why he's not. Maybe this is his drawback. Just a couple of things to think about in, in, in that regard to the player. Now, up next, we have the defensive attributes. And defensively, I always say when it comes to these forward players, whether it's wingers, forwards, tacking mids, we always check 
just to see if they're tracking back and remaining in formation, how, how tactically astute they are with maintaining the shape behind the ball. While defensively, he may not always remain in that formation, he's quite aggressive, especially in the final third. I mean, there were a multitude of interceptions that he made that led directly to scoring opportunities in the final third, which proves this. High number of defensive dual wins where he would directly engage with the opponent and, and win the ball. The context for that almost every single time was when he was anticipating the ball going to somebody and he was able to close them down as they were basically getting the ball and he was able to dispossess them. Um, given that we have some issues with tracking back from the likes of Fortunis and even Daniel Podence, we probably need someone that's more like a Masuras to do the defensive work more consistently. But, you know, all things considered, especially in the league, we seem to have more issues offensively at least than we do defensively. Regarding how he is in the air, <laughs> he's just terrible in the air. Positioning is poor, can't really seem to... Uh, gauge the ball well for a header either and probably is not going to be that useful for us in that regard uh, unless he's getting a rebound in those situations but yeah uh, don't expect really anything of note from from him now up next we have a comparison to daniel podence you guys heard me already kind of bring him up already and he's a player that i wanted to compare him to one not just because he had played with him but daniel podence is is one of our best players so far this season, even if he hasn't been doing that great towards the midseason break. But it's a great comparison to see really where this guy stands. And looking, first talking about the qualities of the players, while he doesn't carry the ball in the same manner as Podence, he does have this, a lot of the same positives in terms of the end product. Both of them see considerable touches in the penalty area. Both do very, very well carrying the ball for their club, progressing the ball, beating defenders one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, where Podence exceeds Gelson, at least from the radar comparison here, is in his end product. Despite Gelson having significantly better shot power than Podence does, Podence has exceeded in just in general with everything. And you can see that here, the blue, the blue web is Daniel Podence's data. The red web is Martin's and you can see Daniel Podence is pretty much clear, especially when it comes to end product on target for everything overall, more volume and shot opportunities, goal assists. And to, ex to an extent, I mean, this is to be expected. He is playing in Greece. The Greek league is by no means the same quality as the French league. So the fact that in many respects, Gelson is very close to Pedence is more than promising. I will argue, though, that since Monaco tends to dominate possession more often than not in the French league, we maybe would have liked to see some better numbers regarding, regarding end product. But if he did have that, he wouldn't be sniffing grease. Let's just be honest here. So in the end, while the profile is different, he does represent a winger that should offer a similar impact to what Podence offers us. I do expect that the end product that he has, the volume will increase in the end. Goal contribution numbers will increase. and uh, Assuming other things are in alignment off the field issues or mentality, discipline. If, if all of that's in alignment, there is no reason this guy can't succeed in Greece. And it's not, this isn't a case of, of, of like where we're thinking at Scarpa, where I told you guys in the deep dive, the reason for his success in Brazil was completely different. I mean, this wasn't a guy that's going to take on players. He had an understanding of his players around him and use that to his advantage. He never had that in Greece and he never really showed an effort in that respect. And when you have a player whose value is determined by what others are doing and his understanding of what others are doing, it's a different value proposition here. So in this respect, this guy, Gelson Martinez, this player, this the, the, this winger that we're getting from Monaco has the tools, the quality at the very least to succeed in Greece. Or at least to provide something that close to what Podence has offered us. Maybe not in a similar time frame, but, it, but in general. This brings us to the final verdict. We talked about the data. We talked a little bit about him in comparison to Podence and what he offers versus what Podence offers. And there's plenty of nuance to the verdict. While the player is incredibly talented, he has not played a competitive match since February of 2023. The, the, that's concerning. I mean, even then, last season, he barely played 600 minutes of professional football. I highly doubt that he's coming to this club match fit. The way I see it, 
will be lucky if he can obtain meaningful minutes by the time our conference league knockout round starts. That means that we have to view the value proposition in one of two ways. First, is this a player that we need immediate impact from to succeed in the cup against Panathinaikos conference league win the league? If the answer to that question is yes, then it's not a thumbs up signing as I don't see how he's going to have any short-term impact by the time he's going to be available to us. Well, we could end up being a few points back. God knows out of the cup, you name it from this really tough January. So if we're not getting out of him, anything out of him in January, this it, it's, it's not a thumbs up signing. Now, the second way you can look at it, the second value proposition is, this is a is this a player that we are looking to fix our summer problems with? Sure. If we can get assistance from him winning the league this year, we get something out of him, fine. But he's really more for the summer and to plug a hole that we know is coming in the summer. If that is the value proposition, then it's a thumbs up. He's signed to a longer term deal. It's not a loan. And surely he's got more quality to offer us than the likes of BL this season or the outgoing Solbakin. Assuming there's no off the field issues, then it's one less problem we have to fix over the summer. And that goes a long way. Unfortunately, we will never have this clarity from the club on either of the above. So taking it like it is, the way I see it, the guy's replacing Sobakin. And is he an upgrade over Sobakin? Probably doesn't take much at this stage to say yes or to offer at least even more than him or Scarpa. Sure, maybe that's not a very optimistic way to look at it, but this is the reality. I'm not saying he's going to be a slam dunk because this club has taught us in the last 18 months that things can always get worse or at the very least just not get any better. So the context for him fits in the tactics of what we've seen from Carvajal. Carvajal is going to use width and play a lot of crosses and volume inside the penalty area. We've seen that already in just a few matches with the club. So heavy use of our fullbacks, which means the wingers need to be able to go inside to help crowd the penalty area, as well as maybe make things happen one-on-one -on -one against defenders. Gelson fits that bill. He also is not, I repeat, not another loan. Very important. So that's one last problem. Ideally, we'll have to worry about in the summer. So the fact that there are, that there are question marks regarding his fitness does make me hesitate to give this a two thumbs up. But aside from the fact that he's apparently a head case, unfortunately, our short-term future does matter. and We cannot continue to afford to bring players that are overweight, not match fit, and wait two months for contributions from them. The title race is tight, and we have a really difficult January, starting off with Ike in the league and then three matches against Panathinaikos. While we've heard Carvajal is a great man manager like Michel, the only thing that compensates maybe for the head case issue and and, and not the fitness issue is that, the fact that he has the, the tools to deal with this type of character. On the bright side, it's not like he's yet another player that we're rehabbing from a season-ending injury, in season injury. So in that respect, I give it a, a thumbs up and a half for those reasons. So far, both early signings in the winter, they've been pretty pragmatic. Context fits the tactics of what we need. Unfortunately, both of these in their own ways are still gambles. Gelson in particular is more so of a gamble and not a BAM. BAMs do not come to Greece anymore. I'm so sick of reading about BAMs in Greek media. It is a joke. This is a gamble. This is a gamble on a player who has not played an official match in almost a year and is known to be a problem. While it's not Omar Richards or Biancon, it's still a gamble and nothing short of it. So remember that. Now, let's hope for the best in the new year. Let's hope that both the signings of Gelson Martins and even Fran Navarro are just strokes of genius. Strokes of genius business. I would love nothing more than to say that. Because we can't go, I, I can't go through another 18 months of what we've already gone through. So I'm hoping that for the best with this, he has the quality. I mean, this guy has quality. It's, he's a great player. It's just about making sure we can keep his head on straight. So I hope you guys enjoyed the deep dive. I hope you found it valuable, the information I gave you. I hope it gives you some insight on the player that we're bringing in. At this rate, I probably have at least three or four more of these to do in the winter. God knows. But don't worry. I'll be ready for it, and I'll make sure that you guys are too.
I'm Adi. This is Gate 7 International by the fans for the fans. We'll see you next time for the next scouting report or the next post-match.